The Fermi Paradox Part 2 The Civilization Equation Frank Drake, formulator of the equation that bears his name, gained his lifelong interest in extraterrestrial intelligence after hearing a lecture given by Otto Struve, director of the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in Green Bank, Virginia. In 1958, Drake joined the Green Bank Observatory himself. A year later, spurred on by the publication of a paper on the subject by rival scientists at Cornell University, Struve authorized him to use the radio telescope to search for signs of alien civilizations. Drake named the project Ozma, after the fairy princess of a faraway land full of strange beings. Drake's project focused on two nearby sun-like stars, Epsilon Aridini and Tau Ceti. Tau Ceti revealed nothing, but Epsilon Aridini produced, to his shock, a massive radio pulse that, at first, seemed like a confirmation. However, after he modified his receiver to remove terrestrial signals, the pulse disappeared, and was later revealed to be a secret military radar experiment. Nonetheless, the project caught the attention of other astronomers, and in 1961, J. Peter Perman, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, persuaded Drake to hold a meeting at Green Bank to determine the research potential of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. In planning the meeting, Drake realized that he would have to put the goal in concrete terms, and to this end constructed the Fermi question that would soon be called the Drake Equation. The Drake Equation is usually expressed like this. N is the question the equation is asking, which, in its simplest terms, is how many civilizations exist in our galaxy with whom we can communicate via radio. R star is the number of new stars formed each year. Fp is the fraction of such stars that have planets. Ne is the number of such planets per star that may support life. Fl is the fraction of those planets that go on to develop life. Fi is the fraction of planets that go on to develop intelligent life, and Fc is the fraction of planets that go on to develop a broadcasting civilization. Lastly, L, the final and most ominous number, the lifespan of such a civilization. The much-anticipated meeting fell, oddly appropriately, on Halloween, and armed with his equation, Drake set the parameters before the assembled group and asked for their opinion. The group comprised many in the community that would eventually coalesce around the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, or SETI. Alongside Perriman, Struve, and Drake himself, guests included Philip Morrison, who had co-written the paper that triggered Project Ozma, astronomer Su Shu Huang, neuroscientist John C. Lilly, whose career is too long and controversial to discuss in detail, but involved ketamine, sensory deprivation, and human-dolphin sexual relations, and, most notable of all, astronomer Carl Sagan. A household name today, Sagan would soon be immortalized as one of science's great communicators. The youngest person present at the meeting, at just 27, Sagan was already a Miller Fellow at the University of California, Berkeley. One of the few astrophysicists of his time with an active interest in biology, he followed up his PhD by studying with Harold Urey, one of the formulators of the Miller-Urey experiment, which had produced basic biogenic molecules out of primordial atmospheric gases. In later years, SETI would become his life's passion, a passion he promoted to both the public and the U.S. government, thanks to the fame and respect he earned from his monumental television series, Cosmos. The first question, how many new stars were formed in the galaxy each year, was fairly straightforward. Estimates at the time put the answer at one. After concluding that, since most stars in the galaxy form in binaries, and binaries were considered unlikely to have planets, the number of stars with planets in the galaxy was estimated at between 20 and 50 percent. The next question, how many planets in any star system were likely to be habitable, was estimated, rather optimistically, at between 1 and 5. The main issue revolved around the extent of the regions surrounding a star at which liquid water could form, which Su Shu Huang dubbed the habitable zone, a term still used today. Given how rapidly life formed on Earth, the consensus on the next question, would such planets develop life, was that life would form where it could, and that the fraction of habitable planets that would develop life was one. The next question was how many life-bearing planets would generate intelligence. Lily had spent most of his career attempting to communicate with dolphins, and was thus introduced as the only person present who had communicated with a non-terrestrial intelligence. He argued to the others that life on our planet tended towards intelligence, 
We share our planet not only with dolphins, but with apes, elephants, ravens, parrots, and several other highly intelligent species. It seemed that if life were to become complex, it would also be intelligent. The fraction was set at 1. How many could communicate with us was set at 10 to 20 percent. By the end, the group realized that the various values they plugged in had cancelled each other out, leaving a value of 1, and so the final answer, n, was entirely dependent on the length of time a civilization would last. Given that the question was essentially unanswerable, they allowed an exceptional range of values, from as short as a thousand years to as long as a hundred million, which in turn left them with a final count of anywhere from one thousand to a hundred million possible civilizations. What the members of this group and others ultimately did with these speculations is the topic of part three. <laughs>